feel about that intro right there? Do a little 80s dance on the stage. Good morning, y'all. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, for those of you that are new, we teach verse by verse of the Bible through uh, Bible books. The reason why we do that is because that's how it was written. Um, nobody wants to start watching a movie halfway through. And so we just start at the beginning, go to the end. Today we're in the book of James. You can turn in your Bible, James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. All the scriptures will be on the screen. So here's a little uh, review about James. He's the brother of Jesus, actual brother. Can you imagine having Jesus in your family growing up? Okay. Uh, more than likely, your siblings were nothing like Jesus. Okay. But James was because he was Jesus, right? So um, brother of Jesus, they had actually brothers and sisters in their family. Um, James wrote this book, probably the first book written in the New Testament. Uh, he led the early church in Jerusalem. Uh, later, he struggles with some legalism, which is interesting. So when we read his book, he's talking about this, this faith. And he, men he mentions the word faith 19 times in his, in his five chapters. He also mentions being a doer five times, and works 13 times. So how do, you, how do you juxtapose works and faith? Like, how do these two go together? And this is where the beauty of God comes out because most of us want to lean into one or the other. We want to say, well, it's all about faith, and I just have faith, and regardless of what I do, it's just my faith, and that's not true. And some of us want to say, it's all about our works. What you do is what you do. It saves you. It does not save you. But... When there's a deep faith, there's an overpouring of what? Natural works, right? So my 13-year-old, uh, my she's up in youth right now, but came in to see me right before the service. And she comes over to me and hugs me. And she brought my sunglasses because I forgot those at home. Um, there's a connection. Like, she didn't have to. Her mom didn't say, go in and hug your dad, you know. She came in and hugged me. Why? Because she has a history of me, of me loving her and caring for her. So she has a faith in the fact that I love her, therefore she returns that love through works. So works don't save you, but they do show who you are. So here's the question for this morning. We're going to talk about wisdom. And what wisdom is, is godly intelligence that's beyond time space that can affect your life today for the rest of the lifetime. Now, a lot of smart people in this room right now, honestly. A lot of y'all made great scores on your SAT. A lot of, some of y'all are training to be doctors, nurses, and you have businesses, and your, your brain trusts. Okay, that's awesome. But that is worldly intelligence, and it can affect tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe, maybe even 10 years from now. But it pales in comparison to godly wisdom. So the calling that we have from Scripture is not to be the best that you can be, and then you're gone. Our call as believers is to be tied into a wisdom of God that is eternal. So you want to uh, impact your children? Rely on your own intelligence. Maybe you will. You can be a good dad, great mom. You can be a provider. You can make money. That's cool. You want to impact your grandchildren's grandchildren? Lean into this wisdom of God. And we'll see all kinds of things, crazy change. Think about this. What would it have been like? And uh, in our family, we talk about fifth generation a lot, okay? So if this, is, if this is you, these are your grandkids, right? These are your grandkids' grandkids. They're probably not going to know your name. Do you guys know your grandparents' grandparents? Like, no. I, I think they were in Iowa or something. I don't know, but that's it. Um, this, to impact this generation... You and I have to learn how to impact this generation. And the only way we can do that is by you and I stepping away from what we think is right and good and prosperous and beg the Lord for what he sees as right and good and for our families. That's godly wisdom. So here's my question. Um, are you interested in godly wisdom? Now, all of us will have to agree with that because we're in church, amen? Amen. Like, who's going to say, is anybody interested in godly wisdom? Well, I, don't, I don't really need that. You're not going to say that out loud, but I'm going to ask you some questions in a minute, and you're going to be able to discern in your own heart, is this something you want, like a free cookie at the office? 
know what I'm saying? You get to office and somebody's like, Susie made cookies. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll take one because it's free. But you may eat it, you may not. It's just there. It's something free, you want to take it. Or I come from North Carolina. We, I grew up on three acres. And when we mowed grass, we mowed grass all day. Amen. Anybody come from that kind of country, hillbilly lifestyle? Yeah, you mow grass, you mow grass. So much so at the end of the day, you're just like shaking from mowing grass all day. And at the end of the day, when we would drink water, oh, that was some good water. That was the best water ever. I'm talking about like hose water. It was just delicious, okay? Because I was in need. And so what I'm going to ask you today is, there, are you in need of wisdom, like a free cookie at the office? Are you in need of wisdom, like God's wisdom to you? Are you thirsty? Are you hungry? If you are, what we'll see from Scripture is that God is an incredible gift giver, and he'll pour it out on you. He will pour it out on you, okay? And that's what we need right there. So real change begins with personal acknowledgement of need. Can we agree on that? So let's pray right now and ask the Lord to convict us. Uh, do we kind of want this wisdom, or are we hungry, thirsty for God's wisdom? Pray right now. I'll do some, I'll do some directional prayer stuff, and then we'll get started. Uh, Lord, oh, thanks for this day. Thanks for allowing me to be here. Thanks for friends and family that I see in the audience. Um, your word doesn't return void. Like when we study your word, there is value every time in it. And today is no different. So we ask Holy Spirit that you would speak, that you would speak to the hearts of Christians here that maybe are a little callous because they're leaning into some legalism or it's a I know or I'm right or I know what I'm talking about. Father, erase that and give them right now a hunger, a conviction of the need for your wisdom. Those that don't know you, Lord, Holy Spirit, you're the only one that saves, so would you just kick open the doors of their heart and show them who you are and what you can do, um, all for your glory. That's what we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Let's try it again. All God's people said, amen. yes, Lord. Okay, here we go. James 1, 5, we'll cover three verses today. This is the first part of verse 5. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom... He or she should ask God. Anybody lack wisdom in here? Everybody's hands up right now, right now. Everybody, hands up. Yes, you lack wisdom. I lack wisdom. I, I am so good on figuring out what I should do and allowing God to be a part of my life. And that is called ignorance, and it's actually, um, it's sinful. So here's the first question. Do you need wisdom? How badly do you need wisdom? Okay. Um, so it's a sliding scale of need. Um, I almost pulled up Maslow's scale of need. It wasn't really appropriate for this. Uh, but I'm going to give you a sliding scale of need. And what I'm going to ask is that you have to be honest with yourself about your own need. Okay. And nobody looking at your whiteboard right now. All right. Just you, you do some some self-analysis. Here's the first one. Your physical body in need of God's wisdom. Uh, some of us will say, I feel good, I'm healthy. Honestly, I don't need that much. Like, I'm, I'm sleeping well, PT, I'm working out. I got, you know, the Apple app fitness on my phone. It's saying I'm 100% every day. I'm, I'm, I'm doing all the things. Like, yeah, I mean, I know I need God, but not really. I'm doing it myself. I'm going to want God to bless me. Second one is, I feel poorly. I'm not healthy. I know I need help. I know I need God's wisdom as long as his directives line up with what I want to do. So as long as God will bring me into better shape and I can still continue to sit on the couch every day. As long as I can do the things. Which means you don't want God's wisdom. You want God to bless your supposed wisdom. Or the last one. This is where we're called to be. I know that I am in physical need of sustenance from my creator. I know that I'm, I know that in this second, God, who is the author and giver of life, can pull my life from me. You know, he can, right? He doesn't owe you anything. I know that tomorrow could be my last day. Have you had conversations with anybody in your extended circle of friends that you, I, I did two years ago? I'm hanging out with my friend, 
And he had nine months left. Healthiest time of his life, making more money than he's ever had, growing family, awesome, smart, caring, entrepreneur, dropped dead one day. Okay? So God doesn't owe you what you think he does. You owe him everything. You are in need of your every second from Almighty God. Now, check out. This is the passage that uh, Cody read to us. Romans 12, 1. We read this first. I'll read this to you first. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing God. This is your true worship. All of us that are religious will say, yeah, yeah, that's good. I worship you, Lord. I'm going to go do my thing in a minute, but I worship you, Lord. I, you're the one. I give you a high five, Lord. You see me recognizing you. God doesn't need you to recognize him. He needs you to obey him. He needs you to come under his authority. So when you see in any passage, therefore, it means it's a, it, it's something came before it that's important. So if we back up into Romans 11.36, the last part of this chapter, here's what it says before what I just read. Check it out. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Give him praise and glory for that. At birth, when you were 12, last year, last week, an hour ago, that is from Almighty God to you, okay? For from him, he is the creator, and through him, only through the power of God, and to him are all things. You have been created for the glory of God, not the glory of yourself. And our world is full of self-glorifying people today. Any social platform you go to, what is being taught and is demonic and evil and it will kill you and break up your marriage and destroy your children is that you are number one. It's self-worship. You become the Baal. You become the idol. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Therefore, because of him being the basis for everything, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's the connector right there. Physically, do you need God? Whether you're healthy or whether you're eating up with cancer right now, you desperately, physically need Almighty God. All right? Emotionally, your mind. This is, this is uh, your mind is a, a beautiful thing, right? It's in, incredible uh, how God has created us it's also phenomenal what a lie factory it is. How much, how much is we're psychotic here. So emotionally, what we say, today is a good day. I'm good. I mean, God, I know if, you, if, you, if you're offering out free cookies, I'll take a little wisdom. I'll probably do what I want to anyway because I'm good right now. Everything is good. zippity doo die. Everything's good with me. Or today is a bad day. I'm not so good, so I need you to fix it. So I'm going to pray for wisdom today, but what I'm really praying for is will you just fix the things that are going wrong, right? Because I didn't do anything wrong. Maybe you overlooked something. Here's where we need to be emotionally. I know that my mind is a deceiver, and I need truth to reign in my thoughts. I need a king in my thoughts that is above and beyond what I think is good for me because I am slowly, either doing it fast or slow, you're just killing yourself every day through your own supposed thought of self-preservation. You're just worshiping yourself and worshiping yourself. and You can worship yourself all the way to the grave and do all good things all your life. Okay? Um, you're worshiping yourself. Jeremiah 17, prophet says this. This is what, not what Hollywood says, or Instagram, or Facebook, or stinking TikTok, or whatever you're on right now. The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. What the social platforms say is, go with your heart. I promise, don't go with your heart. Your heart's a liar. It's going to lie you all the way to the grave. Okay? The heart is more deceitful than anything else. And, and incurable, which means apart from Christ... You will lie till the day you die to yourself. You'll lie your whole life. It's incurable. Who can understand it? The prophet asks. Who can understand it? Verse 10, God responds, I, the Lord, examine 
the mind. I test the heart to give each according to his or her way, according to what your actions deserve. So if your moral heart chooses to do moral things in your own moral name, you will stand before a holy God one day and he will say to you, depart from me. I've never known you. You've been worshiping yourself. You've been good in your own skin. And you've missed it. Spiritual, soul. Here's the, the sliding scale for the soul. Uh, I have conviction and I understand certain truths. I will be convicted about this and I'm not going to do that. This is, uh, I'm not talking to you non-believers right now. I'm talking to you Christians. That you come to a place where you have some higher psychotic lie version of the truth in your mind and therefore you know. You know you're good, and you find yourself in your mind saying, I know I'm called to do these things, but a good God would never tell me to do this. And yet you see it right there in Scripture. You see it right there in Scripture, but your response is like, I'm not sure. I'll just admit that portion about lifestyle, about sexuality, about money, about forgiveness, about generosity, about giving, about friendship, about whatever. And I'm just going to insert what I want to do there so I have some conviction, but not complete conviction, because I am the master of my own destiny. You can also respond this way. I believe I'm the answer to all my problems. Now, let me just say this. Um, I appreciate the honesty of non-believers. Amen? Christians? Some of y'all may not know how to answer that because you're not hanging out with any of them, okay? But if you are loving non-believers, the honesty I enjoy I had two friends they're witnessing in San Diego. Anybody ever been to San Diego? San Diego, California? Even third graders are in shape there. Amen? Everybody's in shape. They're just perfect shape. Everybody's model and just perfect shape. And so my two pastor friends who are actually in really good shape, they're on the beach playing volleyball, and they, they talk to this guy about Jesus. Here's what the guy said. What people from Texas would say, like, oh, that's good. Thanks a lot. They just walk away and do whatever they want to. This dude in San Diego said, you see that? That chick over there, that's my girlfriend. I made $400,000 this year. Why do I need Jesus? Yeah, and so we from Texas are like, ooh, you shouldn't say that. He's a non-believer. He's just telling you the truth. He's, tell he's open and brazen about his idols. And so I would say to you and me, do we fall into this category spiritually? I am completely convinced that Jesus Christ is my only hope for salvation, for change, and for new life. I am hungry for something that will fill me up. I am hungry for something that will take care of this thirst I have constantly for, for new things, for better things, for prettier things, for sexual things, for monetary things. Like, it doesn't listen to me. It never gets filled up. It is the essence and definition of addiction. But the Lord, here's what he says. Thomas, who in the Bible we call Doubting Thomas because he's the one that said, I'm not going to believe Jesus has come back from the dead until I see the holes in his hands and I feel where I saw them put a spear all the way up into his heart. That's Doubting Thomas. Here's what he says. He's talking to Jesus in John 14. Lord, Thomas said, because now he'd seen now he felt, now he believed. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas is like, listen, now that I believe it, I don't, I don't know where, where you're going. How do I know the way? What did Jesus tell him? Hey, Thomas, I am the way. Is, is there like, is he mincing his words there? Is he being untrue or like, well, we just need to, you know, be spiritual in your own self and decide your own pronouns and do all this crap that's about you, not me. No, he says, hey, Thomas, I'm the way. And also, I'm the truth. And also, I am the essence, the beginning, the middle and ending of life. So if you know me, you know the way to go, because I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is saying, I'm the only way to God. I actually am God, and I am your Savior, and you have to come through my blood that has been shed for you on the cross to have the presence of Father God, all right? Your physical life, church, what you eat, 
how you exercise, where you go, what you watch, what you do, how you make money. And money is not bad. And sex is not bad. And entertainment is not bad. But it's all under the context and the authority of Almighty God. Sex, one man, one woman, marriage, that's it. Okay? Uh, money, it's a tool. It's not a God. Entertainment, working out, is not a God. It's a tool to do what? To give glory to the one who is the way. Your physical life is to be lived for Jesus. Your emotions are redirected to Jesus. I have a wife, beautiful woman. I have three daughters, beautiful young ladies. We have two dogs now, both females. I have all kinds of emotions in my house. Amen? All kinds, okay? Emotions are a big deal, all right? Emotions are what drive our whole country politically, uh, money-wise, sex-wise. Uh, if you're born a man and you want to be a woman, you get to be one because that's how you feel. These are all lies. Our emotions need to be sequestered under the one who is the way. That's the only way we're going to find some peace. Your salvation is only through Jesus. Not through how fit you are, not through how much money you make, not through how many people follow you on your social platform. So if this is what you know, your incredible need, guess, guess what? Wisdom from God is your desire. You're, you're recognizing your deficit, and you're saying, I need something more. I need something more. I want, I want this hole to be filled up. Lord, I want you to use all I have for your glory. That is what I need. Verse 5b, second part. So the first part says this. Let me go back and read it. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, that's all of us. He or she should ask God. 5b, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. That's an important word, and it will be given to them. God gives his wisdom what? Generously, okay? Evangelicals have a hard time saying generous. Pentecostals do not, amen? They, they say it all the time, okay? They also say plan to see it all the time, so there's two different things there. Now, I have, my girls when they were little, if I would ask them to share something with me, like we're eating popcorn. Honey, can I have some popcorn? They would go like this. They would give me one kernel of popcorn. I'm like, settle down, generosity, like, whoa, sharing the popcorn that I bought to give to you. So that's, that's, not, that's not the kind of generosity that God has with you and me. From Scripture, he is generous. And he gives his generosity ungrudgingly. What does that mean? So let's say a friend comes to you tomorrow and says, hey, we're in a rough spot financially. We need, we need $1,000. We can't make our mortgage. The kids have been sick, whatever. We need $1,000. And you, you have some extra surplus, and so you give that to them. And then you find out they went out and bought a TV and went on a shopping splurge. And they come back to you the next month and go, hey, we're in need of money again. What do you say? Uh, no, no, because you wasted what I gave you. See, that's a human and normal response. But God is not human. He is God. And so I've got news for you. You and I have wasted godly wisdom we've asked for. Amen? You, God, you've asked God for the right answer in certain situations, and he has, he has poured it out upon you, and your response has been like, mm, that doesn't fit my agenda, and you've gone your own way. Okay? This is huge. God does not hold a grudge against you. He's ready to pour out generosity on you again. And the reason is, is because he wants you to make decisions in his direction. He's pulling for you, church. He wants you to make these decisions because it gives him glory and honor and worship. And God's the only being that can command worship and it not be a sin. God does not predicate what you get based on what you have done. That's our human nature. That's what we do with people. That is not what God does with you. Now, the and the truth is, if you get to the end of your days and you're, you've been walking in your own morality all your life, you, you, 
Judgment will happen. That is real. That is a reality-based fact from Scripture. But those of you that call Almighty God uh, your, your Father, and you call Jesus your Savior, and you're begging Him from wisdom, it is available to you. you. Understand this, and, and this is super clear. We are not asking for things. We are asking for wisdom to navigate our physical, emotional, and spiritual lives. Look, I, I couldn't say this if I was preaching in Africa right now. I couldn't say this if I was preaching in South America. Pretty much I can say it here. We have enough things. We have enough things. We don't know how to manage our things. There's nothing worse that you can do for children and give them everything they've ever wanted. Because now you just created a giant vacuum that cannot be filled. Okay? So we don't need more things, and the things aren't the problem, okay? Our worship of them is. What we need is more wisdom to know how to administer and manage our things. Now, 20-somethings, early 30s, I'm very impressed with y'all because in our 50s, we're like, you know, you need to get older and buy a bigger house. And you guys are like coming out of school and making really good money and like, no, me and my wife and two kids and three dogs are going to live in a 346-square-foot trailer house. That's impressive. It's not something I want to do, by the way. But I'm, I'm impressed that you, your generation is teaching us how to live with less. That's the value of wisdom. It's like we're thinking that if we get more stuff, finally we're going to be satisfied. And the Lord's like, just if you have a little bit of stuff or a lot of bit of stuff... Apply my wisdom, and you'll see it in a different way. You begin to utilize it. Verse 6, here's the, the flip. But let them ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Faith must be applied to this ask. If you're asking for God's wisdom, and you're like, well, God, just give me some wisdom, but you didn't, you didn't, you know, you didn't give me my girlfriend. She left me last year. You didn't give me that business opportunity I had. God is not talking about things here. He is talking about a different mindset to apply to the things that you have. Okay? If you're that doubter, here's what it says. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all your ways. Double-minded means this. You may be in a community of church or community of people where you talk about believing in God and trusting in God all the time. I get you. But when push comes to shove, if your heart is revealed, you don't. You look at God as somebody that should meet your needs, and if he doesn't meet your needs, really wants is what we're talking about, then he's not your God. I've got news for you. He's God regardless of what you think about him. He is a creator regardless of how you feel about him, and he is Lord of heaven and earth irregardless of if you ever bow your knee and confess him as a savior. He is who he is. So here's the breakdown of this passage. We'll call it a day. If you need wisdom, and you do, you really need it, church. Amen? I, I really need it. I, I, the, the lies mostly happen right here. I convince myself all the time that my way is a good way. And the Lord, if you just get on you know, track with me, we can do some good things. He's not your co-pilot. If you need wisdom and you do, you really need it. You can ask your heavenly father who loves you and he will give it to you. Now here's the next question. You do have to ask, but how often do you need to ask? How often do you need to ask for wisdom? I don't know. How often do you need it? How often do you need it? You need it for some, some of the vitamins we take. I've got news for you. Some of the vitamins you take are garbage. You need wisdom for your vitamins. Some of the food you eat is not good for you. Some of the household cleaners you use in your house are killing you, okay? Some of the decisions you make for vacation may not be the best for your family in five and ten years from now. Some of the business decisions, relational decisions, everything. You and I should be begging God for wisdom all day long. Lord, I need wisdom at this breakfast I'm going to. Lord, I need wisdom talking to my mom about that thing right now. You know, I don't know what to say. Lord, I need wisdom in my relationship. Lord, I need wisdom with my kids. Lord, I need wisdom. And what Scripture says about our God is he will just lavishly pour it all over you. Okay? 
That's a good thing. Number three, what you need to know about is what I just said. The gift will be generous. Have you ever been given, look, if you have little kids right now, your Christmas is going to be janky for a while. Just let me give you that heads up. The gifts they give you are weird, and maybe they wrapped them up like 30 minutes ago. They gave you some socks or their soccer ball, okay? But one day your kids do get to an age where they're going to give you something, and it's going to take your breath away, all right? I promise you it's coming. Have you ever, somebody ever given you a gift where it's like they give it to you and you open up and, and you're caught? You're like, uh, I don't know what to say. Like, are you serious? This is how our God gives gifts. He will blow you away with the wisdom he has for his glory primarily and first, but secondarily really for your greater good. For your greater good, okay? Um, number four, God does not hold a grudge against you for the wisdom he has given you in the past which you have wasted. So you and I have to learn how to ask. Now, if you don't ask, for some of y'all, it's because you have been shut down many times, a lot of times by the ones you've loved most dearly. Amen? You were shut down by your dad. You are shut down by your mom. You are shut down by a loved one. And so you stop asking because you don't want to extend yourself and be, you know, your hand slapped again. I've got great news for you. Your hand will not be slapped this time. It will, it will be filled. You can ask for this, and God will give you wisdom, and you will see things that you've never seen before, and then it is your responsibility to obey. Number five, last one. If you doubt God's ability to give you what he says he will, don't expect anything. Stop treating God as a holy butler or a little fairy in the sky that's just waiting for you to, to look his way and he's going to hit you with his magic wand and give you everything you want. It's garbage. It's Hollywood garbage. He is the creator. Through him and for him are all things. He is the one. He is the one that breathes the breath of life into you every day. He is the one that has given you the things that you take for granted right now. He is the one that has offered you forgiveness for your sin and salvation forever and an opportunity to live in a different way. It will cost you everything because you are called to be a living sacrifice, but it is the only way you can really live. Salvation in Jesus. The last thing I'll tell you, and then we'll, we'll pray and call it a day. Doubt is seeing God through a worldly filter. What if, what if, what if, what if? I got to hedge my bets. I got to make sure. I, can, I don't want to say anything to offend my friends. That's really all about you. You're the God in that situation. Faith is seeing the world through the eyes of God. Faith is seeing your money through the eyes of God. Faith is seeing your children through the eyes of God. Faith is seeing your spouse and your employees and your employers through the eyes of God. Faith is seeing your abusers through the eyes of God. Faith is seeing that person just cut you off in traffic when you were singing a worship song through the eyes of God. Amen? It's, it's, all, it's all faith in God and trusting in the wisdom that he so generously will pour upon you for his glory and your greater good. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Communion team, you come on down. If you're new, I would love to meet you after service. Um, praise the Lord. Praise God. Lord, we thank you for your wisdom. It is a generous gift that you don't offer one time. You offer a thousand times, a million times, over and over and over again. You desire for us to make decisions your way. Because they give you glory, and they are obedient, and they're the best things for us. It's not a lesser than life, it's a greater than life. So uh, for Christians in the room, Lord, allow them to be humbled right now. May you wash away their legalism and their self-righteousness, and may you give them a humble heart and spirit to listen to you and to ask for your wisdom. Uh, Lord, for those that don't know you but have heard about you and have experienced you from afar, open their eyes that they might see right now. Holy Spirit, speak to their souls. Grab their hand, Lord, and 
allow them to begin this journey that is under your authority for your glory. It's going to cost them everything, Lord. It's going to cost them their lives, but it's also going to give them eternal life. Your will be done. In your name we pray, Almighty God. Amen. When you're ready, church, come front, receive communion. Communion is only for...